Make sure that what you say is scriptural. Because a lot of times people undo each other's decisions by not deciding what that decision needs to be. I was raised in a home where the decision was clear and I didn't even have to ask from Sabbath to Sabbath. It was said once. My mother said it once and it stood for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen. When I got 15 years old, if I was 13 years old, 12 years old, I was still in church. Because she told me when I was a young man in the single digits that that's where I need to be. Even when she died, I want to tell you how God works. You see, when you put a foundation that's built on God, it stays there and inbred in the deep recesses that sometimes we fail to realize are there. We try to live in a, a, a rebellious life, but there's certain things we can't do because you could hear Mama's voice. <laughs> I remember one Sabbath. Right there in Brooklyn, New York, I went to Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Church, and some of you may know where that is, right there in Brooklyn, one of the largest churches. And I remember one Sabbath, Mama died, Papa don't go to church, nobody to tell me not to go. I got on the bus one Sabbath, and I went all the way out to, uh, to, Bay, to Sheepshead Bay, where they were having baseball practice, and practices for a, a baseball team, and I, and I loved baseball. I didn't start with basketball. I loved baseball, and so I, I got on the bus that I knew everybody would be on going to church. So I went to the back of the bus and sat down and put my baseball glove over my face so that I could try to hide myself. But I couldn't hide from what was way inside. I played baseball very well. When I got to the baseball field, I couldn't even run. I was tripping over myself. I couldn't catch a ball. I was so, dis I was so uncoordinated that I knew that the problem was not my skill, but I was trying to go against the very thing that God had planted in my heart. Friday night came for the football. I played football also. And I don't look like it, but you know, that's all right. <laughs> I want to say I didn't play for the whole season. I got hit once and that was enough for me. <laughs> I got hit so hard that I said to the coach after the game, I quit. When I get to be 30, I want to be able to talk still. <laughs> you see, I got hit in the helmet. And I thought, this is not what I'm built for. But the point of the matter is, they had, a, they had a dinner on Friday night at our school for the football team, and they said, if you come, you get your jacket and you get your big old letter M. I went to Madison High School in Brooklyn. I still have a jacket and a, and a, and a big old M out there somewhere waiting for me. Because Elder Brooks, I couldn't in my... There's nobody in front of me saying, don't go. But I could hear Mama in my mind, it's the Sabbath. Don't go. And I couldn't get on the bus to go. There was nobody to stop me. Brethren, there's no conviction like the Holy Spirit's conviction. But there were some strange things about that too because I could party, but I wouldn't go to this banquet. So God had to work on that room in my life. So that's why he sent my wife. Can you say amen? Brethren, you have to realize that sometimes we look at situations like an opportunity, but the Bible says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. And Jacob decided that that was his season, that was his time, that was his opportunity, that was his prerogative. And so verse 33 has been written for that reason. Then Jacob said to Esau, swear to me this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Now I want to pause and say, I told you in the beginning of the sermon, sometimes it takes a long time to realize the impact of our decision. But this one is still going on to this very day. If Esau had realized that for more than 4,000 years his family line would be fighting to recover his birthright, he would never have sold it. 4,000 years. Had he realized that that single decision, brethren, there are transactions in life that are humanly irreversible. That's why you got to make decisions wisely. Am I telling you the truth? Yes. Now, those of you who are in debt with credit cards, you know what I'm talking about. You sign that bottom line and you don't read that fine print. And every time you miss a payment, the phone rings. <laughs> and you go down and peek at it. Who is that? <laughs> irreversible. Humanly irreversible. Decisions that you made without the forethought of the long-term impact. And then they say, you know, it's only, it's a three easy payments of $19.95. Ain't nothing easy when you have to pay for it. All of a sudden, $19.95 seems like $1,995 when the time comes to pay it. You know why? Because the cumulative effect of all your other bills together makes it huge. 
There are decisions in life that cannot be overturned. I've seen families. Sometimes people want to regain their position in the family, but they can't because they forfeited the position at the very beginning. And it takes a lifetime for them to realize that had they been where God intended for them to be years ago, the respect they want now would have been there all the time. Yeah, I'm the youngest in my family. My wife is the youngest in her family. I love every one of them, but I've got to say, and this is not a biased statement, I believe, and this is my own conviction, I'll let her family correct me if I'm incorrect, but I believe she's the most spiritual one in her family. That is among the siblings, and she's the youngest. According to the birthright, it should be the oldest, am I correct? But if you, forf if you forfeit what God has given to you by proxy, you cannot recover it. When God gives it to the one who favors the principles that God stands for. Look at verse 34. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. That's my sermon title, lentils. And he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. At the time it seems to satisfy his deepest desire, but to this day, to this day, and I'm going to say this, to this day I believe that that's, that meal of lentils have left a bad taste in Esau's family's mouth. Right. To that time it tasted good, but 4,000 years later there's a bad taste in his family line's mouth. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, listen very carefully. He represents those who lightly value their redemption purchased for them by Christ and are ready to sacrifice their airship to heaven for the perishable things of earth. Multitudes live for the present with no thought or care of the future. And like Esau, they cry, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. They are controlled by inclination rather than practice self-denial. They will forego the most valuable considerations if one must be relinquished the gratification of a depraved appetite or the heavenly blessing promised only to the self-denying and God-fearing, the claims of appetite prevail and God and heaven are virtually despised because they fail to look at the long-term impact of a single decision. And so the entire sermon winds up to these three points. I have about 15 of them, but I had to narrow them down to three. Are you ready? Here we go. The testimony from Esau, here it is. Esau's appetite was more important than his birthright. Brethren, watch out when your appetite is more important than your divine appointment that God has in store for you. Let me make it very clear. Can I meddle a little bit? Thank you for permission. Some Adventists are no longer satisfied with the truth. And they go to other churches to get their praise on and end up leaving the truth for a momentary emotional high. They despise the importance of their birthright, and now they are more satisfied with hands held high than standards held high. They worship the music, the artist, and the musician more than they uplift the Savior. And it's, and it's nothing but lentils, a pot of beans. Let me keep going since I got started. Esau sacrificed a heaven-sent blessing for an earthly indulgence. Lesson number two. Some Adventists no longer value the truth as the truth. They have traded divine inspiration for intellectual stimulation. Evolution has become more desirable and God and creation has been cast aside. But it's nothing but lentils. A bowl of beans. And my final one. Esau didn't value the position that he, was, that he had by his birthright. Many no longer value the position that is theirs by the rebirth. Some treat their Bible Christianity like a cheap inheritance. Some are willing to trade their new life for an old fling. They go back to the way they lived, dress, ate, the things they drank, the places they used to go, the entertainment that satisfied their inner desires. Some refuse to come to Christ because His terms prohibit the things that they admire more than Him but it's nothing but a bowl of beans, lentils. And brother, never forget this. We will never find outside of our birthright 
what's only available in it. Amen. 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 I've been married 27 years and I say to people, you'll never find outside of your marriage what God ordains to be only in your marriage. Amen. You'll never find out, outside of God's plan what's available only in God's plan. And God's got a great plan, doesn't he? I mean, God's got a mansion built for me. I don't even own a home, but I got a mansion somewhere with my name on it. Can you say amen? God's got a house made with pearly gates. And not carpet, but golden floors. I'd rather walk on gold than wear gold. Somebody say amen. But some folk rather wear it. If you rather wear it, God's not going to have anybody in heaven chiseling up the streets to put it in their ears. Can I be frank about it? Yeah, a lot of people ain't Frank anymore. There's somebody else. Walking in heaven, want to rip the gates off to put it around their neck. You got to get, get that solved down here. What do you say? I'm going to walk through a gate made of a single pearl. And I'm going to be in the presence of adoring angels. So I got I to I got, I got get used to the music of adoring angels now. If the music is leading me back to where I used to party, i got to leave it alone and come back to where I don't need to party, but I need to stand firm in Jesus. i never forget Elder Brooks. i got to say this. You may remember this. Elder Brooks one day said, it's not how high you jump, it's how straight you walk when you hit the ground. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Some folk want to jump. God's not asking you to jump. God's asking you to walk a straight line. God's asking you to reflect His glory, not your own. God doesn't need another singer. The angels adore him day and night. So it's not musicians that God's looking for. God's looking for folks that want to make a covenant with him by sacrifice. I won't let a rebel in my house. God's not going to let rebels back in his house. Satan got kicked out. We're not going in sinning. We've got to trust the all-divine ability of God to change our lives. And by the way, if you don't like God's plan, you just won't be there. That's that simple. He'll cry, but like they said, not forever. Somebody once said to their son, lady said to her son, I'm going to miss you, but not forever. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to cry for you, but not forever. God's going to wipe them tears away and you won't even be a memory. Not forever. So you got to make up your mind now. Is it lentils or is it eternal life? Somebody say, eternal life. Eternal life. Make up your mind. There's a mansion. Jesus came down to this crummy old earth. And took your bowl of lentils and gave you his robe of righteousness. Yeah. Nowadays, 2010, we think that somehow God has become a different God. And so now he understands. And I know it's going to be against the law to talk this way. But while it's not against the law, let me say it frank. And by the way, when it is against the law, I'm going to still preach it. Yeah. Amen. Because yeah. I don't preach what's entertaining. I preach what's right. Yeah. Somebody say it's an alternate lifestyle. I say it's sin. God never intended for a man to be with a man and a woman to be with a woman. Amen. Amen. And if it's bothering you, turn it off and pray that it won't bother you. Because if there's something in God's Word that bothers you, that means you are not finished filing yet. God's got to melt you down to reshape you to fit you into heaven. That's why some of us go through fiery trials that we do. Because God's got to melt our program to fit us into His program. You got to pray that God will throw your plans out if it doesn't match his plans. Don't pray for God to bless your plans. Pray for God to give you his plans. All kinds of nonsense in the church nowadays. And people say, well, I don't like the way you preach that sermon. That's okay. You know, the sun melts butter but hardens clay. What kind of heart do you have? So I don't, I don't fall into those categories. Somebody got upset with me that I preached about jewelry in Australia. And it was a man. Isn't that amazing? It was a man. I remember, you know, so I looked this guy straight in the eye and he said, now, I, hear, I hear you preach all the time, but I got to rebuke you on that sermon. I said, I'm not going to accept your rebuke. I don't accept rebuke for something that's biblical. Amen. And I said, now, I apologize for the fact that you were raised legalistically, but that, I'm not here to atone for your life. I got to tell it like it is. God says, you are a watchman on the wall. If you don't give the trumpet a certain sound and the sword comes, you are going to be responsible for their blood. And I know that when I stand for Jesus, I'm going to answer for my own sin. By the way, on that note, Jesus paid it all. What do you say? Yeah. I don't have to worry about paying my own sin. He looked at me, and down that 42 line of uh, traditional family members, he found somebody in there that one day is going to be called just, not because of what I...